Hello everyone, we're back again with another video, but today it is not a critique video. This is an interview that I recorded on Thursday, and that I had on Thursday, between myself and Professor Bart K. This interview was primarily focused around the science. You'll hear me preface in this interview before we even started really talking, that many of the interviews that Bart has had with other people are quite similar. They're the same. And that's of course because there's always new viewers and new neophytes, let's say within the space that enter the space and there are constantly new people learning about him and everyone else within the space like Anthony Chafee. But I wanted to center this interview around something else, that being the scientific element of things. We're not going into granular details, but we really focused on why science is so fraudulent nowadays. Why are we focused around this bread and circuses element, that being human nutrition science, instead of looking and referring to hard sciences like I encourage other people to do and continue to hammer in, in my videos like bio chemistry, human physiology, chemical anthropology, physics, for example, when talking about calories and referring to other sciences that allow for more judicious inferences to be made, like comparative anatomy, paleoanthropology as a whole, and things of that nature. Evolution should be added to the causal list as well, the hard sciences. And instead of referring to those, we focus on human nutrition science. So I asked him about that. I asked him about how he even began to be a student in university in the first place, why he decided to do such things, what he experienced there, etc., etc. So, I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. I think that a lot of people would benefit from his answers and are also quite curious about the questions. And even if you weren't, I hope that you learned something. So, I do, before we get going with this, want to apologize for the quality. First of all, I'm trying to get better at recording Zoom meetings because, to be extremely honest, the internal camera on Zoom is quite lacking in quality. With that being said, let's just jump right into this. And once again, I hope you guys enjoy. Hello, Bart. How's it going? It's going very well, Ed. How's it going for you? Yeah. So let's just get right into this. Um, introduce yourself. Who are you, if you may? Uh, what is your academic history? What are your credentials? What do you do now? And what do you promote? Loaded, but... Yes, I, I'm a grifter that says things on the internet. I've never been involved in academia in any way. I have no qualifications whatsoever. I'm a complete fraud, apparently, according to some, <laughs> just because they don't like what it is I have to say. No, actually, I was involved in academia for for roughly 20 years plus or minus plus 20 plus yeah um i have been involved in undertaking research teaching postgraduate students as well as undergraduate students i've done supervision of a number of theses for people's advanced research degrees as students i've undertaken a number of multi-million dollar external consultancies with major organizations in the fields variously of the physiology of rest and exercise human nutrition and also cardiovascular pathophysiology as well as having a command of statistical methodology and procedure research design ethics and all that kind of stuff as well as kind of you know, a result of being involved in that industry for, for that long. These days, I have turned my back on academia and I spurn it as I would spurn a rabid dog. Uh, I, those of you that got it, that was definitely a Rowan Atkinson homage, if you like, or shout out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, academia has lost its way. It's become a cesspit. And um, science has been the loser, actually. Mm -hmm. So these days, I, my my gig is to critique others who are not competent to critique science, critiquing science or saying what the science is. And my gig is on my channel is saying why they've got that wrong, basically. All sorts of fun. That's me. Right. Awesome. Yeah, it's funny. I, I asked you who you are. Most of my subscribers are actually from your channel, so they probably already know that. But, you know, mm -hmm. just as the preface. But it's funny you actually mention science in the first place because most of your interviews are centered around the carnivore diet. They're centered around whether how you actually came across it, how you adopted it, uh, when you adopted it, and for what reasons. So most of everyone, once again, knows what you're going to say about that, uh, especially many of my subscribers. So... My channel is centered more so around, and you're familiar with it, uh, simply what is true and what is false. And when assessing that responsibly, you arrive at carnivore. So it's not exactly based upon carnivore per se. And that's similar to yours as well, like you just said. Um, 
with that being said, once again, it's funny you mentioned science because that makes me want to focus this interview primarily on the science aspect of all of this. Uh, your background with science for one, but also how you can help put the power in people's hands with respect to their ability to discern between what is true and false with respect to, you know, the field of health science, right? Mm -hmm. So that brings me to the next question. Um, when did you start university as a student? And then what made you want to go to university in the first place? You know, what were your goals in life to begin with, just as a start of the journey? Yeah. Uh, when I was a young man, the, the world was my oyster and I saw all sorts of crazy things that I might end up eventually doing and tried all sorts of different things. Um, I started a generic science degree pretty much straight out of school because I didn't want to go and get a job at that time. Right. Really, not because I was interested in um, being a student per se, other than it was better than having a job at that time. And I quit that and eventually ended up working full-time in a service station for a number of years, um, during which time I was also moonlighting as a rock god with ringlets down to the small of my back the full mascara doo -doo 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 -doo, guitar mm -hmm. and singing in, in a band um so i did that for oh well it turned out i was 27 before i actually started the first of my degrees which i completed interesting um so, yeah, I was very much at that stage, I was classed as an adult entry student. I didn't get in because of grades, because I didn't have any grades to get into university. I wouldn't have got in with the grades that I got from being at school, because my school experience was um, more about chasing tail and less about learning anything. I went to a co-educational school. My focus was not on the work as a young man at all sorry about that um so that was the story and then yes yeah, suddenly i was 27 years old with thinning hair no longer did i have the poodle rock mane um i had also got to the point where i realized that pumping petrol in a service station and playing guitar was not gonna get me the I guess the financial stability and not going to cut it. Wanted. <laughs> not not going to cut it. it. Yeah. So I thought, well, I better start doing something. And so I started doing uh, my first degree actually was a degree in um, what was then being called sports science. It was the physiology of rest and exercise, basically. And the biomechanics of it too, I guess, was part of that program. So did you uh, still also... go, did you still go into that thinking just, just to do something? Uh, or did you do it because you were actually interested in that to some degree? Yeah, no, at, at that stage, I'd realized that I needed to get a career and I'd realized that I needed to produce more income than I had been and et cetera, et cetera. And I was focused on getting that first degree as part of a process that was always going to end with at least one terminal research degree and a field of expertise by that stage, I'd actually decided I'd quite like to be in academia as a teacher slash researcher slash consultant. And so that's where I was headed from that point. And I was focused on that from that point. Um, and as it turned out, I graduated with first class honours, went straight through and, you know, did the master's thing and then went on and specialised and got a, a number of terminal degrees, research degrees based in in those three fields of expertise that I claim expertise in. So it's safe to so, say that now you actually do have, let's say at least an interest or passion in that you eventually garner that you gain yeah. an appreciation for it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that actually, that covered one of the next questions that I already had, which was, you know, what made you decide to become a lecturer afterwards? So, mm. We now know, or we know now, that universities are not at all credible anymore. You just said that in the preface of this whole thing. 
-hmm. Was that the case when you were going to university and or teaching as a professor, or has it simply just gotten worse? If it, if it has been, has it simply just gotten worse? Or was that really mm -hmm. not at all prevalent uh, to the degree when you started being a lecturer? Yeah. Okay. The actual information I was taught in my first undergraduate degree was not good. The stuff they told me was demonstrably incorrect, it turned out, as I learned more beyond that when I started doing my own research and tracing the history of some of this stuff. However, that aside, what was valuable and what I did absolutely grasp with both hands was the discipline on how you do science and how you communicate about what science you have done or that has been done by others. Um, I learned very, very early on that if you want to critique, publicly comment on, or be seen as competent to speak about science, one of the requirements is you must yourself be capable of being presented with the raw data set that those authors collected and analyze that data set statistically yourself to see whether or not a they've done it correctly and b that their statement of conclusion matches the data that they have collected. I realized very early on that if I was not myself capable of doing those mathematical equations, knowing what should be done and how to do it, then I would not be a competent commentator. And I would like to offer that to everybody else out there who thinks they are a competent commentator on science who could not themselves do what I've just described because I'm sorry, you are not. Yep. You actually said that recently in one of your videos, you said mm. that if you cannot actually conduct the science specifically with these, you know, statistics and research methods, which is very broad because you use that with any other kind of science, then you shouldn't mm. be speaking upon it publicly. And I thought that was quite interesting, not interesting as in ambiguous, but it's definitely 100% what I agree with. One of the things that I'll do in my videos is whenever scientific papers are brought up, I do know rudimentary levels of how associations do not prove causation. We learned that in high school, even without the teaching of statistics and research methods. And ironically, that's 50% of what I have to attack because they don't understand that. Uh, yeah. I, you, you can, there's some things, of course, that you can derive from the abstract and, and the methods as well. But looking at raw data sets, I'm being 100% transparent. I'm not extremely coherent in that, not even half coherent in that. Um, unfortunately, that was actually a good, this is a good segue because you were saying that in the scientific field, what you were taught originally or in university was false, but you did learn how to, um, be disciplinary with the employment of science. The thing yeah. is, is what's unfortunate now is I'm I'm split because I do have funding to be able to go to a university, to college or whatever. I'm of course averse to that because of what we just discussed. However, in order to actually be able to be the most competent commentator I can be, I have to know how to perform science. And you don't just learn that yeah. by sitting in a house talking. And so I'm split and I'm sort of leaning towards actually going, you know, because the, unfortunately, and I do say unfortunately, and I don't have, I have any qualms with saying unfortunately, it is unfortunate that you have to spend that much money and also be taught a bunch of nonsense just mm -hmm. to get the 10% of what's of utility, which is learning how to perform and conduct science yeah. to therefore be able to interpret it. Yeah. What I mainly focus on in my videos is the biochemical aspect, which you can learn a lot of online of the utmost veracity as well. You just have to be sagacious mm -hmm. enough to discern between what's false and what's true. But even then, I am aware of the fact that biochemistry is not just learning biochemical pathways. It's also learning how to be in a lab and study certain things. And so I'm very careful with what I talk about in my videos. I keep my mouth shut whenever they say something that I don't understand. You will actually, if any, many people may have already picked up on that. Uh, perhaps not because I make super fast cuts, but who knows? Um, I, I'm 
I want to be the utmost responsible commentator on this stuff because of what we're seeing today with the irresponsibility and, and the misanthropy mm -hmm. like you talk about all the time. I learn a lot from you. You've made a lot of videos that are now on your Odyssey um, that I've I've looked at. But, you know, you can only post so much and keep people entertained. You talk about it all the time. A lot of people don't actually want to learn. They want to be entertained. So you, you can only get so much and drive so much out of entertainment versus actual education. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that before we go on well, the next question. Yeah. The, uh, beyond learning, you know, how to conduct science, how to be disciplined, uh, you know, how to set up a research design, all of that, you can learn that at university, you bet. How to do statistical analyses and support inferences, you can learn that. So that's a utility. The third utility of doing such a thing is that you get the piece of paper at the end, which is the secret handshake. It's your invitation to join the club. The appeal to authority, which unfortunately... Rightly or wrongly, yeah, rightly or yeah, wrongly. Yeah. Which unfortunately in 2024 still people exhibit, which is something I mentioned on the channel all the time, like appeal to authority, appeal to authority, yeah. really? 2024, mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. But yeah, actually, before we even move on, it reminds me as well of other health commentators on here that think they're younger than me, making it to where they hold health consultations with other patients, mm -hmm. patients, clients, mm -hmm. as if they know anything about how yeah. to, I would not, it would be years until I did something like that. Right. Exactly. I mean, I'm one of those people. So. I mean, I'm one of those people that, um, and this isn't me being sanctimonious. It's just the truth where even if I knew everything about this stuff, I'd still hesitate because I'm so worried about saying the wrong thing to somebody. And people don't have that inhibition anymore, especially in my generation. They just say whatever they want. They say whatever mm. they want. So mm. amazing. But yeah, so this is a similar one. Uh, we know today, again, that the majority of people, including authority figures, it's something that it, actually most predominantly nowadays, authority figures, are not scientific and derive most of their opinions from the wrong types of science. Not even just the misinterpretation of the right kind, the wrong kinds of science. Those being fields that are intrinsically unscientific, no control, such as human nutrition science. Was this always the case? You sort of answered this already, but was this always the case when you were going to university and or teaching as a professor? And why do you think that so many people are so like recalcitrant when it comes to abiding by scientific discipline within the field of science and or so averse to branching out of the field of human nutrition science to find the answers as to how humans ought to live dietarily and lifestyle-wise? Right. If you... A person right. determines that they are going to be in the fraternity, for want of a better word, of the human nutrition scientists, then it behooves you, A, to produce works published in journals which are focused in that area so that you become known as a contributor in that area, which means that you'll probably play by the rules that those journals have in order to get your works published in those journals. Mm -hmm. It's really the journals whose responsibility it is to uphold the standards of scientific discourse because the leading coalface of the scientific discourse is that which is published in the peer-reviewed literature that is deemed to be our gold standard, that is deemed to be the stuff that you can rely on and take to the bank. Ergo, we would expect people that edit such journals to apply the disciplines to say to people writing in, please publish my paper. Here is my paper establishing absolutely cause and effect between factors X and Y. Here is my associative study that proves this. It behooves that editor to send that paper straight back to that author and say, you need to reword here because you have an associative data set that can not inform on cause and effect, risk, hazard, or any of those related metrics at all. Not one jot. Go and rewrite it, and then send it back to me, and we'll, we'll consider it when it's worded appropriately. Sadly, that's not what's being done. Here's what's being done instead. Number one, huge sums of money are being paid to groups of scientists by companies with a vested interest in the words of those scientists 
those scientists are dutifully writing the words that they've been paid to write, and they are then submitting it to the journal for peer review and publication, having been looked at for credibility and veracity? No. In fact, what's happening instead is that the same companies who are paying the authors to write the words are also paying the journals who are publishing those words to publish those words written by those authors that they've paid for. That's what's happening instead. And yes, it's got much, much worse over the last 20, 25 years. To the point now where, as I say, academia itself has become a rancid cesspit of disinformation, theology, propaganda, spin doctory, and anything but good advice of veracity that people can take forward and trust in any way. Yeah, that's why now, I mean, you see a bunch of private institutions trying to be opened up. Uh, and I mean, of course, since the public ones have such an enormous amount of money, they can shut them down indirectly. Of course, not exactly directly, but they, you, they can trounce them. Uh, mm. So it's not been successful thus far, but hopefully within the next few years or maybe in a decade, whoever, how if we even make it that long, right? Uh, mm, that yeah. actually, <laughs> that actually works out because I'm ready to have that revival. I mean, really, I, it would be awesome if universities actually had as, as much credibility as they used to. You know, yeah. your plaque meant something. <laughs> exactly. When yeah. I started in academia, the important metrics for teaching staff were around the achievement of grades by your students, those students being compared to the acceptable grade standards end of discussion. How well did you teach the accepted standards to these students? How well did they grade? Good job, average job, poor job, whatever. When I finished in academia in about 2018, it was the important metric that we as academics were being graded on by our institutions, our employers, was the students idea about their experience in our class yeah good yeah, never mind sounds... did they learn anything never mind did i teach them anything of value how did they feel about me as a teacher just yeah just you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, i used to be known for standing up in front of a group of students and say look buttercups i'm not your friend I'm not here to make you feel better about yourself. I'm here to put the truth in front of you. Suck it up. <laughs> yeah, people so, don't really, people don't like that. Mm. People don't like that anymore. No. Mm, now it's no. just got to be treacly nonsense. It, it's it's ridiculous. Uh, all those guidelines. And it's pred everything's mm. predicated upon compassion and all that stuff. And it's just ridiculous. Sacrifice the truth. It's always the first to go. So, mm. but... Yeah. So once again, following this, I mean, we've had some individuals within the health influencer space that shall not be named uh, that have started to host consultations, some as young as 18. I think they've mm. stopped. Let's hope. Mm. Uh, mm. But in, in your opinion, at what point is someone able to responsibly claim or assert authority to host consultations with clients to give instruction on what actions to employ in their lives with respect to improving their health? Right. So there, are, there is a legal standard which says, you know, who can and who cannot undertake this kind of work for money in most countries. Unfortunately, in most countries, the standard as to who can legally do this is anybody, so long as they don't claim to have qualifications, knowledge or skills that they don't have. Mm -hmm. And that's the tripping point because most countries also have a law of tort which is, okay, maybe you're practicing as an electrician without an electrician's license or any training in being an electrician. Anything you do will be judged according to the standards that would be expected of someone who did have those qualifications and skills. And if your service as a amateur professional electrician turns out to be below those standards, then you can be sued. 
but there's nothing stopping you doing it in many countries in terms of giving people advice. In terms of acting as an electrician, there absolutely are laws. I and mean, that was just an example. You can't actually go and be an electrician without an electrician's license. Well, physically, you can do it. You could front up to someone's house, charge them money, and do some electrical work on their house without being qualified. You could do that, but that is illegal. Whereas anybody pretty much can give someone advice on their nutrition or health or whatever else, so long as they, you know, don't break some other laws in so doing. And I think that's one of the problems. My opinion, the actual answer to the question, is that... <laughs> I think a person who wants to consult with others about their health should ideally have at least a decade's experience in the underpinning theory, the science behind the area in which they want to work preferably as a publishing research scientist, i.e. a person who has genuinely contributed to the knowledge base, an actual expert in that field. That's Makes my sense. opinion. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, I didn't know how you would... Uh, I mean, I actually thought that you'd be a little more uh, you'd have more stipulations. I mean, that's actually a lot of people may think that's too harsh, but I don't think so. I think that's not harsh enough because I mean, it's mm. a big deal when you tell people like basically how to live their lives, especially desperate people. There's not just people that are just curious. These are people that mm. in many cases are really struggling, really struggling, yeah. especially in this space. And I mean, to, to put on a straight face at 18 years old and look at these people and be like, Oh yeah, yeah. This is what you should do. And I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, it really is, it is arrogance of, it yeah. is the, that is dictionary definition of that right there. But mm -hmm. no, that makes sense. Yeah. So really, I well, mean, this might. Anyone that wants to listen to an 18 year old kid who patently couldn't tell the difference between his anus and his elbow, if he labeled both and taught him to read really deserves what they get though, to be fair. Don't they? Yeah. Or gingivitis. Remember that? Yeah. Or that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brush your teeth, son. Yeah. Mm. Well, this one might be a little curveball, but actually it's something else that I was curious about. So this is taking a break from the science, science real quick. Uh, I actually, that summed up a lot of, you know, questions that I had. And also, I think a lot of other people probably had as well. There's a reason I'm doing this. It's not just for my curiosity and to entertain, you know, what I'm interested in. Mm. A lot of people have these questions, or at least I think they should hear it. Uh, because a lot of people are very, most people are confused as to where to even mm. start. Everyone says that this yeah. is a fact, this is a fact, et cetera, et cetera. But I was wondering, I mean, you talk about this a lot on your channel. I'm not the only one that does. In fact, I mean, I, I, I learned a lot of it from you, so that's where the similarity comes from. But um, how long do you think you'll actually be making those videos for the public? Do you see yourself stopping anytime soon? Um, there is a limited amount of energy for anything. However, every time... I see a video put forward by someone speaking authoritatively about a topic they patently know not the first thing and giving contraindicated, stupid advice to people. It reinvigorates me emotionally. It excites me to some degree. Oh, here's another victim for who's wrong on the interwebs. Here's a video I can make. Here's, you know, here's a way of getting my message in front of a few more people this week, hopefully. Because at the end of the day, what I really want to do is get my message across to people, as many as I possibly can, such that I'm allowed to do so by Al Gore and his rhythms on the platform of choice. Um, but a lot of people that have seen some of my material will level at me all sorts of accusations. And I'm not talking about the he made up his entire background accusations because they're patently ridiculous. I'm talking about people say, well, this guy is actually an unreasonable science denier. His standards are unreasonable is what people will say about me. Unorthodox. That's what's 
Well, that's what it is. Unorthodox is another one, but unreasonable. And I'm actually a science denier here because any any science that people bring up, I'll say that's no good because I'm not a science denier. I am insisting upon science. Well, that's if what I meant. If you want to tell me, yeah, yeah, if you want to tell me that your argument is underpinned by science, then you bring me some science. Yeah. No, if that's you what bring I... me some wishwash that looks like science but isn't, I'm going to point out that it's not. Right. Yeah, I, I was the one... Thing. I was the one saying it's unorthodox because unfortunately what you say is unorthodox. It, it, it is because yep. what science mm. is today isn't science. They just put the label on it. Uh, right. It's 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 just unfortunate. And I didn't know, of course, I didn't know that either. At one point I was listening to, you know, people like Paul Celadino, the enticing, beguiling Paul that puts up studies on the screen for three seconds and I can't read it or mm. couldn't read it mm. even remotely years ago. And I'm like, well, it must be right. Because that's how our brains work sometimes, especially in desperate yeah. situations. So Several hundred grams of rice and potatoes have now been added to his already several hundred grams of fruit, Goodness. by the way, now. I know. Wow. I just sent, yeah, yeah. I, I was just sending around three clips on Instagram of him talking about how to have an animal-based diet for breakfast or how to eat one for breakfast. And uh, instead, what happened mm -hmm. is he said four different fruits uh, before he got to eggs which was actual animal yep. food. So pretty typical. It's just getting worse and worse. I think he's genuinely convinced himself yeah. of the lie. Yeah. I think he's genuinely convinced mm. himself of the lie that he's been espousing. And that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, um, that yeah. was actually, yeah, it was exactly what I expected. It was quite brief. Um, most people, once again, already know who you are, but if you want to say anything for the new viewers as to where people can find you, um, then that, this, this is the time to do it. <laughs> so a platform of choice purely because of the audience that is possible to get there as well as long as Al Gore allows me to have some audience there that is is the YouTubes and you can find me there by punching in at Bart hyphen K-A-Y easy all my other YouTube channels are also linked under there I also have offerings on another video sharing platform that go back to the very beginning. Actually, there's several thousand videos up there. You may have to take some kind of an odyssey of adventure to find that. However, odyssey would probably lead you to find where that might be. Um, so you can look that up for yourselves. And uh, if you're interested in the platform formerly known as Twitter, you will also find that uh, His Royal Highness Edward Yellow, King of the Bears, uh, has a has a uh, presence there and is saying things to people over there. Short words, mostly. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well, it was nice having you on. Uh, we will be back again, I think, soon to talk about something very special. Cerule, I believe. Uh, something you're very, very familiar with, considering you're a <laughs> you're an affiliate, and so am I. So, um, yeah, we'll be back then. So, once again, thank you for uh, being on. Mm-hmm.